The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, welcome everybody. Welcome on this uh, on this Sunday afternoon. I hope you're having all having a fantastic, uh, fantastic weekend. All right, today we are going to be doing something different, and we'll see. Uh, you'll have to let me know if you like it or not. But uh, today we're going to take a br- take a break from politics. We'll probably pick that up tomorrow. We'll take a break from the state of the world as it is right now, and I am going to give you my musings. Because that's the best, you know, that's the best I can think of in terms of describing this. My musings on the Renaissance, Florence, Michelangelo, art during this period of time, and and really why Florence is the birthplace of modern Western civilization. That is the birthplace of what we today recognize as uh, Western civilization. Now, of course, it has its roots, as we'll talk about in in Greece, but in terms of uh, the, 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 the renaissance of Greek thought and the, um, you know, just everything we associate today with Western civilization, it really all begins in Florence. Um, so I, I'm going to, you know, tell you some of my experiences at Florence, what I think, uh, what I think about this history, uh, what I think about Michelangelo and some of the other characters of the Renaissance from Leonardo da Vinci uh, and, and Donatello and some of the others. I don't know how much you guys know about art history, how much you're interested in art history, but you're going to get some integrated with a, a broader historical perspective of Europe in that period of time and, and what is going on. Um, now, I say musings because I am not an historian. I am not an historian of art. I am not an expert on any of these things. Uh, it, it, you know, it's it's uh, it is more uh, you know my just general interest, and I think I have some interesting thoughts about it. And I think I know more than uh, than a lot of people do. But hell, you know, if you're really interested, if anything here is something that really interests you, then you should definitely go and take a history course or get a book or read something. I would also warn you that there is a lot of um, revisionist history, a lot of revisionist history going on about uh, European, particularly early European history. Uh, th- there's a lot of attempts, and there has been for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, to present Christianity as this ultimate force for good, as the dominant force for good uh, in, in Europe, and uh, to present the, what we call the Dark Ages and, and the Middle Ages as not dark and, and not bad and actually pretty good and, and uh, a civilizing force. And without Christianity, what would have happened? It would have been a lot worse. You know, when, of course, when one is without Christianity, if Rome would fall in exactly the way it did and everything. But uh, the whole idea is that, no, 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 the world wasn't that bad. And, and uh, the Renaissance is not really rebellion against, against religion in any kind of significant way. So I don't buy the revisionist history. Uh, the Dark Ages were dark. And the Renaissance is a massive transformation of the way Europeans think, or at least some Europeans think, and a massive transformation in the artwork of, of Europe, I think, that reflects reflects um, the, this intellectual transformation that is going on uh, you know, all over Europe, in Florence, but also primarily in, in the very north of Europe, in the Netherlands and in, um, in parts of Germany, in Belgium, but in the, in the very north of Europe, and ultimately, uh, ultimately in England. But there is, the Renaissance is a real revolution. It is not just a, you know, this would have kind of an inevitable consequences of Christianity. So I warn you against the revisionist historians. Uh, I am, I certainly don't adhere to their ideas and uh, much of what I say will offend those of you who want to claim that, that Western civilization is essentially Christian civilization and that's it's its heart and at its core. I don't believe that. I don't think the historical evidence suggests that. 
So let me just give you, and I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about the Dark Ages and, you know, you, 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 there's some wonderful books about it and uh, I should have prepared. But anyway, I don't really have the book about the Dark Ages because I wasn't really, I wasn't thinking of talking about the Dark Ages. But I'll tell you something, and a lot, as I said, these are musings. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about are anecdotes from my various travels in Europe and particularly in Italy. And uh, I am going to, I'm going to, you know, the, so a lot of it is, is anecdotes that I picked up along the way. And, and one of the things, one of the most stunning things to me was a trip I made to Italy a few years ago where we visited Pompeii. And I don't know how many of you know much about Pompeii, but Pompeii is just outside of Naples in Italy. And Pompeii, what makes Pompeii unique is that it was destroyed in a, um, in a, a volcano eruption, Mount Vesuvius. Uh, and the, the volcano, because the way it erupted, it basically covered the entire city, and therefore the whole city of Pompeii, was when it was excavated, I think in the 19th century, it basically was the same as it had been uh, the day the earthquake, the, sorry, not the earthquake, the, the volcano, the volcano went off. So it is a, uh, you know, the only, the only complete city we have from the Mormon era, in a sense, undisturbed, by other people building on it and stealing stuff from it and destroying. And you can learn a lot about Roman civilization and about, but, but what was interesting in my visit there was, was to learn about Roman technology. And the idea that in Pompeii, they had pipes with running water and faucets. Europe didn't have that again until the 19th century. They had sewer system. A real sewer system underneath, under the roads. Again, Europe didn't have that until the 19th century. They had what for them were skyscrapers. And you can see this also in Ephesus in Turkey, in the old, uh, in the old uh, Greek ruins. And, and you can see multi-story homes and in Pompeii. I think it was, I can't, I can't remember exactly, four, five, six stories. Europeans couldn't build more than really two stories, homes. Um, after the fall of Rome. So, you know, it, it, it was none, none of this technology survived the fall of Rome. None of this technology was picked up by the, so, by the Christians in the so-called wonderful Dark Ages. No, Europeans didn't have this for over a thousand years. A thousand years. Mauricio says seven stories in Pompeii. Seven stories. And here's another stat. Rome, at its peak, Rome had, in the Roman, during the Roman Empire, Rome had a million people. A million people lived in Rome. In the Dark Ages, at the bottom of the Dark Ages, in the darkest part of the Dark Ages, Rome had 10,000 people there, living there. Now, it's not that everybody else died. Many of them did. It's that they all went into the countryside because one of the symbols of civilization, one of, the, one of the evidences of civilization are cities. Cities in which trade happens, in which labor specializes, in which you have the specialization of labor. When you don't have civilization, when you don't have law, when you don't have any kind of uh, 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 economic infrastructure development, growth, any kind of legal infrastructure, you don't have cities. So Rome goes from a million to 10,000. The shocking thing is, when, when did the first European city have a million people in it? Again, it took about 1,500 years. 1,500 years before London has a million people. That's the first modern European city with a million people. So it's truly, you know, so the revisionism is just nuts, right? I mean, there was clearly a dark period. Now, that doesn't mean there weren't some people somewhere doing some things that might have been of value, but very little. And indeed, Again, counter to the revisionists, 
uh, it was in the Muslim world in which uh, innovation, progress, science, math was developing. And, and between 900 and 1400, I'd say, whether it was in the Middle East and later on in Spain, it was the Muslim world where you were seeing any kind of significant technological and mathematical progress and scientific progress. And indeed, some of the things that made Florence successful is one of the things that made Florence successful is its relative proximity to the Muslim world, its relative proximity to the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and the fact that m much of those uh, developments, for example, double entry bookkeeping, which was an innovation of the Arabs, came in through southern Italy from northern Africa and established itself in Italy, and that gave Florence a, 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 the, the simple technology of double entry bookkeeping gave Florence a huge advantage as a banking set sector uh, later on. All right, so, uh, so there was this period called the Dark Ages, and, and uh, it, it was a horrible period, uh, and it was, it was, a, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a period in which quality of life, life expectancy, by every dimension, human life was horrific. horrific. All right, now, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Florence. Florence is a city that was founded by uh, actually Julius Caesar during the, during the Roman Empire, yeah, before the Roman Empire, during the Roman Republic. Uh, he basically gave the area of Florence to his soldiers as, as reward for, I guess, winning a battle and, 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 and working under him. Uh, being good soldiers, and he, he gave them this area because it sat between two rivers, uh, very fertile ground, uh, very fertile ground, uh, and uh, they established the first, you know, uh, city town there. It became during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages a center of wool production. They were very well known for for producing high quality, high quality textiles that were then exported to uh, to Northern Europe. Florence also early on, because it sat, uh, it, it was it was a major trading center between places like Rome, northern Italy, and ultimately northern Europe. But maybe more importantly, it was a trading center between the Arab world, the Ottoman Empire, and the northern Europe. Florence very early on became became a uh, a financial center. And many of the financial innovations I mentioned, double entry bookkeeping, but many others were invented by, uh, by the bankers in, uh, in, in Florence. And this goes back to, I'd say, the late Dark Ages, the beginning of the, the Middle Ages, uh, 1100, 1200, and so on. And, and so Florence is a thriving place. It, it has a population going into the Renaissance of about 70 to 100,000 people. It, it, it has a lot of wealth. It is considered by many in Europe to be one of the lead cities in all of Europe. And much of that is a consequence of both the wool trading and, and the banking. And there are multiple, you know, uh, homes or, or noble families, if you will, in, um, in Florence. Not noble in the sense of nobility, noble in the sense of wealth, that, that primarily their wealth comes from either banking or fabrics. Now, remember that, you know, it's hard to time, it's hard to date the Renaissance, it's hard to say exactly when it starts. Um, Ayn Rand uh, wrote about the fact that really the pivot point in terms of Western civilization is the writings of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, you know, and Thomas Aquinas dies in 1274, 1274, a long time ago. Uh, Aquinas is... is maybe not the first, but the most significant Catholic philosopher to, to introduce Aristotle's thinking, to introduce the ideas of logic, to introduce the idea of a secular world and the importance of a secular world, to introduce even the idea of, of individual happiness into kind of the thinking of his time. And you can't imagine a Renaissance without Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, in, a, in that sense, is the guy who sets the Renaissance in motion by introducing the philosophical ideas. 
that later are embraced by all, all kinds of Renaissance thinkers. Um, you know, and, and as you know, people talk about it both in terms of, on the one hand, the scholastics, the kind of the, the, the people who are trying to apply reason and rationality to every aspect of Catholicism, but in doing that also do some good work in things like, uh, in things like economics uh, and in other areas. But also the, 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 the humanists who are trying to really step away from the Catholic Church and secularize it. And the humanist, the whole idea of humanism is, is part of, you know, it's part of this period. It's part of the Renaissance. It's part of the intellectual life in the Renaissance. This idea of can we establish, can we, can, can, what are the secular ideas out there? What does nature tell us? What does reality tell us about truth? Aquinas sets this in motion. He sets it in this motion because he takes Aristotle seriously. He writes about it. And he is so well regarded within the Catholic Church that they cannot ignore it. And it becomes part of the Catholic Church. And you see, within a hundred years, you really start to see a significant difference in the culture, in the art of primarily Italy, but even, even Northern Europe as well. You see a significant secularization of the art itself. So some people date the beginning of the Renaissance to, to 1350. Other date the beginning of the Renaissance to right after Aquinas dies. I, I think 1350 is probably uh, m more appropriate. But if you, if, you look, if you look at the art of the pre-Renaissance period, if you look at the art, let's say, before 1300, before a painter by the name of Giotto, who is a, who is a Florentine painter, starts really painting, everything is flat. Everything is New Testament. Everything is New Testament. People, are, bodies are unreally recognizable as bodies for the most part, although when Jesus is on the cross, he's usually depicted in very abstract terms. Very, you know, uh, he's usually been depicted as thin and pretty pathetic and very abstract. There's no anatomic detail. There are no muscles. There's no life to the painting. The paintings, the sculptures, I mean, Iron Man called the sculptures of this period before 1300 uh, gargoyles, human beings distorted, perverted, groveling. There's really, there's no, I mean, there's of course no perspective, but again, flat, unlifelike, unlifelike. And what you start to, start to see in the 1300s, in the early 1300s, is the beginning of painting of people who are alive, who are more human, who have skin with a texture and skin with a color of skin, where you can start seeing a little bit of muscles and maybe even some expression. The expression, you start seeing it with, with uh, Giotto, uh, in, uh, in the early 1300s, you start seeing Madonna and child, and the Madonna actually has an expression as her face. She's not just flat. She's not just expressionless. And you start seeing the beginnings of attempts at creating some perspective, pretty primitive, unscientific, but the attempt at creating some depth in painting. In the, so, uh, during the 1300s, you're starting to see the beginnings of art that is breaking away from this, or, or not breaking away, that is trying now, at least to some extent, to begin imitating reality. Imitating reality. Starting to look and paint, rather than just abstractly paint a Jesus, a Madonna, and groveling human beings, saints all over the place. In 1403, another important date in, um, in uh, Florentine history, Ghiberti, another great artist from this very early Renaissance period, is announced that the winner of a competition to sculpt the doors of the great Dumo, the, the, the great cathedral, in, uh, in, uh, in Florence that is being built 
And uh, the doors are actually not for the, uh, for the cathedral itself. They're for the baptistry. And there are three massive doors. And what's fascinating, if you ever go to Florence, and I encourage everybody to go to Florence, it's one of those, if you want to understand history, it's one of those great places to see the amazing, the, j just how amazing the Renaissance was. Go, go to Florence and look at the three different doors on the, on the uh, baptistry. And you can't see the originals outside. You have to go into the museum. There's a museum called the Opera Museum uh, right next to uh, the Domo. And uh, go to the museum, and you can see the three doors. And it truly is stunning to see the difference between what is being sculpted. This is relief sculpture. What is being sculpted early, middle, and late, right, in these doors, and how different, how different the sculptures are. And I'm... It, with each iteration, because it takes years to sculpt these doors, right? Because they, it's, it's sculpture in metal, and uh, it's, it's, it's really, 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 um, it's really, really, really hard to, you know, to, to, to sculpt this. It's in small, it's relief. Relief is really hard because you have to create the illusion of three dimension in a two-dimensional medium. And um, what you see is how the sculptures come alive. From door to door to door. In each one, they are more alive than the other one. They're more three-dimensional. There is more perspective. Right? This is also a period in which the first real great Renaissance sculptor is sculpting. And that is Donatello. And even with Donatello, you can see huge differences. He's sculpting saints early on in his career. And the saints are clothed. There's a certain flatness to them, primarily because they are, even though they're three-dimensional, they're put in niches, so you only see their front. And then by the time, by the time he sculpts his David, the first famous David, there's another one by uh, Viraccio, I'm not pronouncing that right, but there's another David about the same period. The David is nude, the David is 360 degrees in the round, the David is confident that David is secular. And indeed, just think of the theme. Early in the Renaissance, and certainly in the Middle Ages, everything was about the New Testament. Everything was the New Testament. Almost everything is, has Jesus and the Madonna in it. As we enter, as we enter, um, as we enter later into the Renaissance, as we enter the heyday of the Renaissance, sculpture becomes, and painting becomes, more secular. They become more secular partially by adopting themes from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a far more secular document. It's a historical document in many respects than the New Testament. David, David, who is one of the heroes of Florence. He's one of the symbols of Florence. That's why there's so many Davids in Florence. Not just Michelangelo's David. But there is Donatello's David. There is Vocaccio's David. And there are paintings of David. There are other sculptures of David. David is everywhere. But then there's also Judith. I don't know if you know the story of Judith from the Old Testament. But Judith is a, uh, is a leader is a leader of, 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 uh, of the Jews in the Old Testament, before they were kings. She's a, a, a political leader. She's a military leader. And she's out to fight some enemy. I don't, I don't remember the name of the enemy. Somebody on chat will probably say it. She's out to fight the enemy, and the, and, and the enemy has this ferocious general uh, who, who everybody follows who, and, and who, is, who is feared by everybody. And what Judith does is... She seduces this general. She goes to his tent and seduces him. And when he falls asleep, she takes a sword and cuts off his head and shows the head to the enemy army, and the enemy army retreats and runs away. No God in the story, no miracles in the story, just an incredibly courageous woman doing what it takes to defeat a brutal, horrific enemy. The, the name of the general is Holofenes. Fenes, something like that. It doesn't matter. 
You can read you can read the Old Testament and you'll find it. But the point is that it's a secular story, just like the David story is a secular story. David goes, now true, he's chosen by God to do this. He's told by God to go do this. But, you know, at the end of the day, he goes and he faces this giant of a warrior and he kills him single-handedly. Right? It's a fundamentally secular story. God is not intervening. It's not claimed even that God intervenes. He's an excellent marksman, marksman with his um, slingshot, right? So what you start seeing is first a movement from everything's the Old Testament to secular New Testament heroes. And you see Florence as a thriving, relatively wealthy, prosperous city. You see Florence embracing these secular heroes. So two of the main heroes that are identified with Florence and that appear in lots of art, from paintings to sculpture, are David and Judith. Indeed, Donatello not only does a David, he also has a painting of Judith chopping off the head of this enemy general whose name I cannot pronounce. Right. So you get a transition, and there's a third transition coming, but this, this, uh, and then a fourth one. So there are four transitions in the, in the history of art, if you will, as we become more secularized, from Old Testament, from, sorry, from New Testament to Old Testament, but not just any Old Testament, secularized images in the Old Testament. Then from the Old, from the Old Testament, to Greek mythology, right? And you can see that all over the place from uh, another one of Florence's heroes is Theseus, right? The Greek, the Greek hero. And then from, from Greek mythology to just secular scenes, the scenes that have nothing to do with religion, have nothing to do with their life. It's scenes from the life of the world going, around, going on around us. All right, so that's kind of a, a, a brief uh, synopsis we're, we're at about Donatello. Uh, let me just mention, uh, Greg reminds me, Robert Mayhew, uh, the objectives philosopher, has a really good talk on the history from the, of, of uh, Aristotle and Aquinas' roles. That is how Aristotle's ideas are manifest during this period of time in European thinking, and Aquinas' role in bringing those ideas into European thinking and, and causing, if you will, being a cause of, of the Renaissance. I recommend Robin Mayhew's talk on Aristotle and Aquinas. Uh, it's, in, it's in the East Store, and it's, uh, it's called Aristotle and the Renaissance. Aristotle and the Renaissance, you can find it in the Ayn Rand Institute East Store, Easter and then look for Robert Mayhew and it's Aristotle and the Renaissance. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent talk, real, uh, you know, much more scholarly than what I'm doing here. And, uh, and it gives you this academic, oh, not academic, philosophical explanation of how it all happens, historical philosophical explanation of how it all happens. Jennifer asks, can you contrast art as influence on culture versus a reflection of it? I mean, that's really hard because I think art does both. I think art does both. I think art both is a reflection of the culture. So artists, in a sense, can only get away with so much, particularly in this era. They don't want to be accused of blasphemy. They don't want to be accused of, of doing inappropriate things by the church. So they, 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 are, they are reflecting, but they're also, you know, like, like, mo mo like even the character of artists today being avant-garde. But they're also avant-garde. So they're also pushing the boundaries. Right? They're also pushing the boundaries. So they are introducing new, in a sense, they're introducing in their arts the new ideas that are being promoted by intellectuals at the culture at the time that have might not yet reached many people, but are now going to reach them through the art. So art is at the forefront of delivering, you know, uh, philosophical ideas, philosophical attitudes, 
a sense of life that is being articulated by the leading thinkers of the time that is, n that is not infiltrated yet into the culture and indeed will not infiltrate into the culture until the artists do it. Right? And artists, particularly in this period of time, are also some of the leading intellectuals of the time. And therefore, they are introducing new ideas into the intellectual air at the same time. So, so let's take an example. I mean, implicitly, not explicitly. Implicitly, they're doing this. So let's take an example of, um, you know, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. One of, the things, one of the things that they do and one of the things that makes them so heroic and, you know, they, they can't, they don't know anatomy. They don't know anatomy. They know anatomy books. There's no anatomy. Nobody knows anatomy. Remember, this is before the printing press. So there's certainly no books. But nobody knows it. And yet, what they want to do is sculpt and paint reality. So they know they need to know anatomy. They know they need to understand anatomy. Right? So this idea that they need, to, they need to figure it out. So what do they do? Well, they sneak into morgues late at night and they cut up bodies. Now, what is the penalty for cutting up bodies? The penalty was death. If they'd been caught, theoretically, they could have been they, could, they would have been and could have been killed. So the penalty for what they were doing was death. And yet, for their art, they were willing to go into the morgues and cut up bodies. And as a consequence, they learned anatomy. They knew anatomy. Now, they couldn't write about knowing anatomy, and they didn't. But what they did is they started to project this knowledge in their sculpture, in their painting. And they started to make the sculpture and the painting more and more realistic. Now, the fact that people were suddenly looking at painting that was more and more realistic, and again, if you go to Florence and you go to the Uffizi Gallery and you look across the painting over time and you see the realism becoming, you know, you see the transformation towards realism, that is conveying something to the observer about that the artists think that the world is worth paying attention to, that life is worth paying attention to, that the human body is worth paying attention to. And that, I think, shapes, particularly among young people, a certain attitude. Oh, it is, in spite of what the church is telling me. In spite of what the church is telling me. It is important to look, to observe, and to understand. Reality is not to be avoided. Reality is not to be shunned. Reality is to embrace. That is the message being conveyed by, just by the style, just by the fact that they're putting real muscles, that moving, the sculptures are in motion, and they, they've got muscles, and they've got a realism about the human body, and it's not just reality. The human body is worth admiring. Now think about that in the context of a Christian message. And this is why it's such a revolution when sculptures become naked, when they're nudes. Because the whole idea of, 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 of nudity and, and original sin and, and, and sex in the context of Christianity all viewed as negatives. And then suddenly you start seeing Nude sculpture. Donatello in 1430 is sculpting a nude David. Now, David wasn't, I don't think, nude at the battle. Maybe he was. I don't know if that's what the Bible says. Now, there's another David, as I said, Vocaccio's David. He's not nude in that David. He's wearing, he's wearing something. But Donatello's, he's nude. Now, that's revolutionary. You can actually put a nude in a sculpture, out there. The human body is something to be admired. It's something to be respected. It's something to be studied. And that's, 
that's a revolution in the way people think. Again, think in terms of Christianity, Christianity of the Catholic Church back then. And this is something very unique, by the way, to, to, um, to the Italian Renaissance. You don't see uh, nudity. Uh, <laughs> you don't see the nudity in, um, in Northern European um, art until much later. Now, Northern European art during the Renaissance is, um, is more secular earlier. They do portraits of people in a day that they left. So there's much more of, um, uh, of the secular, of the day-to-day -day life, of respect for wealth in, uh, in Northern European uh, painting and sculpture uh, than there is in Italian. But nudity is something that the Italians bring to art. And I think it's, it's a large extent the discovery of nude Roman sculpture, uh, and, and primarily Roman and some Greek sculpture uh, that they're excavating during this period in Rome and in other places all over Italy. So, um, you know, Italy, I think because it is, the, it, it is where Rome was, it was where all these artifacts of Rome, you know, benefits enormously from getting exposure, direct exposure. The artists, that's another thing about this period. I mean, two things I want to say about Florence before we go on with the history kind of thing. Two things about Florence. One, not only is Florence the center of, of commerce and center of banking, which are important, but Florence is also, you know, is also a republic. It's, it's relatively free. It is relatively independent from the Pope. It has a secular government. The secular government is elected. It has these weird elections where, you know, you get you, once every two months, they have this big draw, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a draw. It's like uh, everybody's name is in a hat, and you pull out the names of the people, and those people serve in government for, ex for two months, I think it is. And then, um, and then once they, uh, once, and, and they can't leave the halls of government. So they're stuck in the halls of government, so nobody can influence them, right? So they're in the halls of government for two months, they do their thing, then another group is elected, in a sense. They, 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 they're drawn out of a hat, and they go into government. So uh, they're, they're relatively free place. There's relatively free speech. There's, the Inquisition is not, you know, there's not a lot of religious enforcement. And that's why most of the breakthroughs, most of the breakthroughs in terms of pushing the envelope are happening, are happening in Florence. In 1452, so uh, again, Donatello's David is, public, is, is, is in 1430. In 1452, Leonardo da Vinci is born, not far from Florence. And one of the questions I want to ask in a minute is why are so many geniuses born around Florence? Is it the water? Is it the air? Is it the genes? Maybe it's the genes. Um, so Leonardo is born 1452. Um, by the way, uh, uh, and then... Let me just see something. Uh, when is uh, Michelangelo is born in 1475? So 1452 is Leonardo. 1475 is uh, Michelangelo. Now Leonardo is an interesting story. Leonardo is a bastard, and because he's a bastard, he cannot join his father's guild. So if he had not been a bastard, he would have had to join the guild. And, uh, and, and become, I can't remember what his father's guild was, but whatever the guild was, he would have joined the guild. But one of the things that happens with Leonardo is, uh, you know, so he's left alone. He, he, he doesn't study in the guild. He, he kind of, he has a lot more freedom, if you will, than if he had, if he had not been born a bastard, right? Um, but he loves to draw, and he's constantly drawing. And so his father and other people see him drawing and see, wow, that's, that's good. And this is, this is part of this idea of why they're geniuses in Florence. 
They admired ability. They admired ability. And then they invested in ability. So when they saw Leonardo could draw really, really well, they sent him to somebody's workshop to learn to draw properly, to be a painter. And Leonardo studied to be a painter. When Michelangelo was working in a stone quarry, which is where his family had sent him to work, oh no, schools, right? Kids worked in those days. And somebody saw him make little sculptures while he was at work, carve out little sculptures. They saw an ability there. And they immediately recommended him to Lorenzo de' Medici. And he was invited to the Medici's who had a sculpture school in their gardens. And he was placed in those gardens. And learnt how to properly sculpt. So it made Florence, I think, unique at this time. M maybe in some extent in history. Is there was a, well, not unique in the history. There have been other periods and other places where this is true, but, but certainly this is true off Florence. They respected ability. And when they identified it, they invested in it. People in Florence did, not Florence as a government, but people in Florence did. So there's a huge admiration for great artists, huge admiration for men of ability, and a recognition of their ability and investment in their ability. And you see that throughout Florentine history. Uh, people sending, you know, people identifying talented artists and sending them to work with other talented artists in this, this system to really reinforce genius. And when genius is identified, it is not crushed. It is encouraged. So Michelangelo is never put down. Right? Now, other things happen to Michelangelo, hopefully, I don't know if we'll have time because we're, I'm, I'm talking so much, uh, this is going to go on forever. But Michelangelo is, um, is never discouraged from his genius. I mean, he is sometimes forced to do work he doesn't want to do, often forced to do work he doesn't want to do, and we'll, we can talk about that with Michelangelo. One of the great tragedies of history is what happens, in a sense, to Michelangelo, because in my view, He's, he's the greatest sculptor of all, all, all of history, and yet he, he doesn't sculpt much because he's forced to paint because that's what the Pope wants him to do. Right. But when he's identified as a great sculptor, people come to him. You know, here's the, um, here's the story about Michelangelo. Michelangelo's just this amazing kid. He's identified as a sculptor early on, uh, he's brought into the Medici household in a sense, in the, he, he sculpts in, the, um, in, this, in this garden school outside of the Medici place, and he is, uh, um, he is admired for his sculpture. And at the age of 20, the age of 20, he goes to Rome and he gets his first commission. And his first commission is to sculpt a Bacchus, 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 something like that, the god of wine. And the god of wine, you know, is, 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 a, is a, of course, a, a, a Greek, a, a Roman god, a Greek god, Greek god. And often the god of wine in sculpture before Michelangelo is always portrayed as the strong, you know, raising a glass of wine, kind of very powerful, positive, almost heroic character. Um, and Michelangelo, and I, you know, it'd be interesting to go into the reasons. I, 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 I would be interested in going into the reasons for this. But Michelangelo instead portrays a god of wine who is just, this is Dionysus, of course, in Greek. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, who is a little tipsy. He, he's a little drunk. He's got a beautiful body, but it's, it's, it's a body that's he's standing in kind of a relaxed pose. And his eyes, you can see, a little out of focus. And it's a work of genius. I mean, you can see it in Florence at the Bodello, Bodello Gallery. It's an amazing sculpture. And, but he is, he's clearly, he's clearly drunk. He's the god of wine. He's what you think of with the god of wine. And I wouldn't be surprised 
if Michelangelo here is doing a sculpture that's trying to critique the person who actually commissioned the sculpture in a sense of you Christians who love wine, this is what you look like. It's a nude. It's an amazing sculpture if you go and see it, right? Not heroic. It doesn't necessarily appeal to me thematically. But when you look at what he's done and how he conveys what he's trying to convey, it's a magnificent piece of work. Anyway, when he shows this, the guy who does the commission says, go away. I mean, I'm not going to pay you for this. Oh, you know, th that's, this is ridiculous. This is not what I expected. I expected a heroic you know, celebratory, toasting god of wine. And you can see in the Bodello, there are, other, uh, there are other gods of wine exactly the same, you know, with that more heroic, more positive theme. So you can see the contrast of what the, the guy wanted as part of the commission. Well, uh, Michelangelo, uh, you know, has, is, is stuck with this. Ultimately, the Medicis buy this and, it, and they ship it back to Florence because it's such a great work of art and they realize that. But uh, Michelangelo is in trouble now, and, and he, he needs another commission desperately. And there is, a, uh, there is a competition to do a pieta. Pieta is basically is Mary holding the dead Jesus in her arms. And Michelangelo sculpts in marble a pieta. And if you've never seen the pieta by Michelangelo, the first one he does, he does at least three. Um, but, but, and the other two are not, not, never finished, but this one is finished. Um, you've got to go, it's, it's, in, it's in the Vatican Museum, it's in the Vatican in Rome. Unfortunately, you can't get very close to it. It's behind glass because somebody at some point took a shot at it with a gun. Uh, so they put it behind glass. It is just one of the most stunning pieces of art ever. It is a woman holding her son who is dead on her knees. The son is strong, you know, heroic to the extent you can tell from a dead body, and she is mourning, and you can tell from her expression. You can tell from the way her hands hold him. You can tell just from the way the clothes are draped over her. It's just a stunningly amazing, unbelievably beautiful sculpture that evokes all the emotion that I think a pieta should evoke. Now, I want to make a point here. Sidelines, so we're going in all kinds of directions today, but hopefully, hopefully this is a value to you. Um, why can one look at a pieta and a Jesus on a cross and have a positive aesthetic experience? It's Jesus, and I hate Christianity. I said it. I hate Christianity. I've said it many times. And yet, here's the symbol of Christianity. And yet, when you look at a pieta, or you look at some of the magnificent paintings during the Renaissance and later of, of, a, of a crucifixion, or if you look at Dali's crucifixion, which Ayn Rand really liked, um, what is it about a crucifixion that is so powerful? And how can one abstract? How can one... How can one enjoy it in a sense or get something out of it and I think to me is I abstract away from the Christian part of it and I think of Jesus as a as a as a, as a fighter for a new set of ideas as somebody who believes in a new set of ideas and is fighting to have them manifest in the world somebody heroic who is going around advocating for new ideas and who is put to death because of his ideas. Jesus did not commit a crime. He did not kill anybody, not rape anybody. He did not steal from anybody. He was a man punished for speaking. In a sense, the crucifixion, I'm, put, I'm putting aside all the Christian meaning, which it means to Christians, I'm putting what it means to me, is a sign, a symbol of the injustice, of injustice, of what happens to heroes so many times throughout history. Yeah, by the way, yeah, so many times throughout history that where people who advocate for new ideas, people who advocate for radical ideas, 
Get crucified. Get crucified. And in art that is actually presents Jesus as heroic, that is manifest physically heroic, right? Intelligent face, intelligent expression, heroic body, muscles, alive, not a symbol of sacrifice, but a representation of an injustice committed to a heroic figure, to a heroic man. To that extent, I can enjoy a crucifixion in a sense that it projects back to me, it concretizes the injustice that often occurs. And you can, you can benefit from, you can get from portrayals of injustice a huge amount. It, it is real. And this is why I can enjoy like Dark Ages or Middle Ages crucifixions. But when you get into the Renaissance, particularly into the High Renaissance, the later Renaissance, Michelangelo's period, it's amazing. And then when you look at the Pietà, this Pietà of Michelangelo's, I mean, here's a hero. Here's the mother of a hero. And the tragedy of it, the sadness of it, and yet the beauty of it are so striking. Now, the Pietà was universally, immediately identified as a great work of art. But people said, who did it? And somebody said, Michelangelo. And they said, no, that can't be. Michelangelo did that stupid Bacha sculpture. It can't be Michelangelo. Michelangelo is a nobody, and he can't sculpt like this. There's no way he could do this. So there was a, there was a, a, a general rumor going around that it wasn't Michelangelo who sculpted the painting. So one night, uh, who sculpted the Pietà. So one night, um, Michelangelo snuck into the place where the sculpture was stored, and he chiseled into the strap that goes across Mary's body, Michelangelo did this, or something to the equivalent of that. Michelangelo sculpted this. Only sculpture he ever signed. After that, he didn't need to sign any sculpture because everybody knew a Michelangelo when they saw it. Uh, of course, his reputation, uh, the, the Pietà, made Michelangelo's reputation. He, he was immediately elevated to being the number one sculpture of the, sculptor of the Renaissance, uh, sculptor of his generation, and maybe, and I believe, ultimately of all time. If you, uh, he then goes back to Florence, and in Florence, there's a big piece of marble sitting, and it's been there, I don't know, I can't remember the exact timing, but something like 80 years it's been there. It's been there a long time. And uh, two sculptors have tried to sculpt into this. They've already chiseled into it. So uh, they've chiseled into the top and they've chiseled into the, into, into the bottom. And so they've already tried to sculpt it. And both sculptors, this is a massive piece of marble, they both walked away saying, this is impossible. It is impossible. To, uh, to use this piece of marble. It's, it's not a good piece of marble. It's, 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 it's too big, but there are flaws in it. There are problems with it. We can't do it. And this piece of marble is just sitting there. It's owned by the city of Florence. And Michelangelo goes, um, and he, he goes to, uh, to, to the leaders of Florence, and he says, um, I want to I wanna do this. And they say, no, nobody can do it. It's just, it's, we need to trash this piece of marble. Nobody can sculpt it. It's useless. And they've already started. So you couldn't do anything anyway. He says, no, I, I want to do this. And he bugs them. And he bugs them. And he bugs them. And he's got this reputation. And he's a young kid. He's 25 years old by this point. And, um, you know, the Medici's, he's from kind of, uh, originally from the, you know, the Medici's like him. So then they say, okay, do it. Take it and do it. And here's this piece of marble that everybody else thought was un... you couldn't carve anything from it. And where the carvings had already been done. Now, marble is not like bronze. Bronze, you, you, you sculpt in clay. And in clay, you can add, you can subtract, you can change, you can change your mind, you can redo it, you can move things. Marble, once you chisel something away, it's gone. You don't stick it back. It's gone forever. So some of the pieces have already been chiseled away. 
And Michelangelo sets this up in a studio, and he works on it. And out of that piece of marble comes, in my view, the greatest sculpture that's ever been produced, the David. And it is truly a magnificent piece of work. I mean, and, and, and the more you see it, the more you see it up close. And when you understand marble and you see the flaws in the marble, the marble was flawed. And the fact that Michelangelo can work in spite of the flaws in the marble, can create this magnificent piece of work in his mid-20s is, is, you know, is truly, truly stunning. Now here's a David who is again naked. He's nude. He stands with confidence in front of Goliath with a look of concentration, focus on what he has to do. It is the moment before he strikes, before the fight begins. Most Davids are either are, are the moment afterwards with the head of Goliath already there, the moment of victory, Donatello's Goliath, Vocaccio's Goliath, of, of, all at the moment of victory. Later, Bernini will sculpt a magnificent David, which is at the moment of action. You can see David, you know, in action, using his, uh, what do you call it? Uh, anyway, getting that stone, using uh, his sling. Yeah, Jennifer, that is a picture that's a kind of a drawing of uh, Michelangelo's David in, in the background over there. It's, it's really... It's really special. Um, slingshot, sorry, slingshot. So yes, so uh, uh, Michelangelo, uh, you know, completes this, and I'm not going to go into the whole life of Michelangelo, but, but, but I'll say this, the great tragedy of Michelangelo, and, and I encourage you to go see the Sistine Chapel, and, and uh, the Sistine Chapel, both the top of the wall, but also his, his, uh, his day of judgment. It's interesting, the judgment day that Michelangelo paints is, is again, is the end of the Renaissance. Uh, he is doing this towards the end of his life. Michelangelo dies at the age of 90, um, or, or I guess 89, uh, in 1564. And uh, he paints the Day of Judgments uh, a few years before this, but at this point, there is a beginning of uh, the Counter-Reformation. So, uh, you know, the Counter-Reformation starts somewhere about 1560, Michelangelo died in 1564. Well, the Counter-Reformation, what they do is they go back to Michelangelo's Judgment Day and they cover up all the nudity. They literally have painters go up there and cover up all the nudity. It's just gives you, again, a perspective of, of Christianity and how during this period of the Renaissance, pre-Counter-Reformation, there was so much more artistic freedom than there had been before. There was this ability to sculpt and create and present secular themes, secular human beings, adoration of the human body, and adoration of human heroism that just Christianity would not tolerate. Christianity would just no, would not tolerate. All right. Um, Sistine Chapel, uh, other things uh, of Michelangelo's uh, is that he started a lot of sculptures that he never finished. Uh, he, there's a sculpture of his in the Louvre Museum in Paris, two sculptures, Dying, The Dying Slave, which I think, again, are some of the best sculptures ever sculpted. They are magnificent. They are beautiful. Again, uh, they're, they're so emotionally striking. They're so emotionally striking. They convey so much in a piece of marble that is just awe-inspiring to, to be in front of them and to admire them and to, to soak them in, to really look at them and let them really impact you and let them really walk around them and see what he does with the muscles and see what he does with the texture and see what he does with those expressions and how, particularly with the dying slaves, their body is, is, is moved in three-dimensional, in, in three dimensions, in, in, you know, inspiring, you know, it's really inspiring. Um, he had projects for dozens of other sculptures, which he never, he never completed, which is truly, truly tragic. One of the things that you see throughout Michelangelo's life is at the beginning you see, and, and this is maybe 
kind of, you see the end of the Renaissance in Italy. And, and Italy really never has a heyday again, maybe with the exception of 19th century opera. It, it really never has a, a, a great intellectual. It, 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 it is the center of the universe during the 15 and 1600s or the early 1600s. And then that all moves north. It all moves north. And the reason is that religion gets reasserted in a way in, uh, in Catholicism and in, um, and in um, Italy in ways that it doesn't in the north. And you can see that in, in Michelangelo's life. So early on, Michelangelo is optimistic. He's completely secular. Um, his pieta is strikingly secular, powerful, emotional. His David is heroic. There's no God. There's no religion. There's no Christianity in David. There's very little Christianity in the Pietà, in spite of its Christian theme. And yet, as Michelangelo grows older, Christianity plays a bigger and bigger part of in his life. Now, supposedly, it plays a bigger part in his spiritual life. He becomes more Christian. But it is imposed on him more and more. He's living in Rome. He's more, uh, he is now, you know, really working at the request, behest of the, of the church. The church is um, dictating the kind of works that he does. He is discouraged by the kind of commissions he gets. He's discouraged by the fact that so many commissions fall away. He, he has a falling out with the Medicis. He is, goes to Florence. He runs away from Florence. He goes back to Florence. He escapes from the Pope and hides in the, you know, in the um, uh, Carrera marble quarries in Carrera. And uh, the Pope has to send his troops to get him and bring him back. He runs away several times. Uh, as you see in his life, you see a sense of life changing. You see his attitude towards the secular changing. You see his attitude towards the pietà changing. And if you see his pietas from, from, from later in his life, Mary can't even hold Jesus up. It's all about the suffering. It's all about, it's all about collapse. It's all about sacrifice. It's all about death. The heroism is out. It's all about the emotion of the crushing nature of what has just happened. The, the, the inability to recover from it. His final pietas are just Michelangelo giving up on life. Giving up on life. And embracing what Christianity really meant. Um, so you can see the end of the Renaissance through Michelangelo, through Michelangelo, uh, which is unbelievably, unbelievably sad, and to a large extent, from there, you know, you still have great art in in uh, in um, in Italy. Primarily, I'd say the sculpture of Bernini, uh, and uh, and and some and some other painters. But the center of art, the center of focal point, both culturally, philosophically, and artistically, moves moves to Northern Europe, moves to Northern Europe. So, in many ways, Michelangelo's life is a tragedy because he is humbled by Christianity. Now, they say he was probably gay. Um, and, of course, you know the attitude of Christianity towards gays. So he had to hide it. He, he had to know what he was doing was a sin. So all of that, combine that all. Um, I mean, it was a rough life. It was a very, very, very difficult, horrible Horrific life, and yet a life of massive, unbelievable achievement. You know that when he usually when you hire a painter to do a fresco, they had dozens of people or a dozen people working for them. You know, somebody would paint the angels, and somebody would crush the paint, and people would hand you stuff. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel by himself. By himself. Every Brush stroke on the Sistine Chapel is Michelangelo's. It took him years. But everything there is his vision. Everything there is perfection based on his vision. Everything there is integrated 
around his ideas. Nobody else touched it. Nobody else did anything. So, I mean, uh, geniuses like Michelangelo are rare. Are rare in the history of mankind. And again, the, the, you know, if you add that to Leonardo da Vinci, and look, Michelangelo didn't just sculpt. He painted. He was an architect. He was an architect. If you go to Rome, you'll see things that he designed and had built. On top of that, he designed weapons and um, what he called defensive mechanisms for warfare. Mike, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was the same thing. He was a painter, a sculptor, an architect, a designer of weapons, and an innovator, an inventor. He was a massive inventor of all kinds of machines, primarily for war, because that's what he got paid for. There's a, Michael, there's a Leonardo da Vinci museum in Florence worth going to because you see a lot of his inventions. A kind of, he designed kind of, a kind of a tank. Um, but all kinds, of, all kinds of weaponry. These, this is where the term Renaissance man comes from. This is where the term Renaissance man comes from. Renaissance man is a man of all trades. Oh, I forgot. Michelangelo was a poet. And I don't know Italian and, you know, I'm not big on poetry. But if you read, supposedly, his sonnets are amazing, are beautiful, his poetry. So he's a poet, in addition to being a sculptor, a painter, an architect, and a designer. Leonardo da Vinci was all of that plus. These are what were called Renaissance men. Men who did many, many things, were good at many, many things, great at many, many things. They were real geniuses, real innovators. This is a time of, of, you know, of great innovation, great progress, um, great success, uh, primarily in the arts, but even in the sciences. Right? Now, Galileo is born around the time that Michelangelo dies. Uh, just one other historical point, you know, uh, um, you know, we talked about the Counter-Reformation. One of the victims of, the, of this Counter-Reformation was a guy named Gio Giordano Bruno, who was a philosopher and a, and a, and a, uh, a scientist uh, who, who extended the Copernican model, who was burnt at the stake for his ideas. Galileo comes a little in, in 1600, I think it was. So this is part of the, part of the Counter-Reformation is this, uh, is... Uh, The Inquisition is in full force. And of course, Galileo comes out, again, out of um, Florence. And, uh, you know, you all know the story of Galileo, but he's already during the Counter-Reformation. But as they are now less, but luckily by the time of Galileo, they are now less inclined towards uh, uh, burning you at the stake. So... Again, there's a certain openness in the church because of ideas. So, you know, I, I, we need to end, and I've got a few super chat questions I want to get to. So, so let me let me summarize here. European history, with the fall of Rome, goes into a period that is dominated by the Christian Church, and is not ac not accidentally called the Dark Ages. It is an age where there is almost no science, no economy, very little trade. It is an age of poverty, death, destruction, war. And just a, just, it is a horrific period in human history. And slowly, out of that horrible state, to a large extent because of the rediscoveries of Greek ideas, of Aristotle, there is slowly an embracing of this world, of reason, and of values, of reason, and of individual happiness. There's embracing of individual heroism. And this is what's projected in the art of the Renaissance. Individualism. I didn't even talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
Brunelleschi's uh, dome at the top of the Duomo. It's a dome. You know, the, 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 the dome, nobody can build the dome. They don't know how to close the dome. The Romans knew how to do it because the Romans built much bigger domes. And it took Brunelleschi in the, middle of the, in the middle of the Renaissance to figure it out for the first time in over a thousand years how to build a dome of that size. Or the paintings of Botticelli and the beauty, the color, the vigor, and the secular nature of those paintings. Nudes, female nudes, Venus, nymphs, fairies, no angels, no Madonnas, no dying Jesuses. But Brunelleschi, the genius architect, and Botticelli, the, but I, I meant Botticelli, Botticelli, the, the magnificent painter. By the way, Botticelli burnt many of his paintings in a mini, in a mini um, counter-reformation in Florence. Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this Florentine priest who preached uh, that all this art was decadent and horrible and we need to get rid of it. Um, in, 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 you know, kind of towards the end of the Renaissance or in, in maybe in, during the High Renaissance. Um, I forget his name now. So, so, oh, here it is. Uh, Sa, Savonaroya, Savonaroya uh, preached all this and uh, Botticelli actually bought into it and actually went out and burnt some of his own paintings. But the ones that survive are so beautiful, so colorful, so life-enhancing. And what you see in the Renaissance is a discovery of life, a discovery of reason, not as explicitly, not as intellectually as it was, would be later on. But I think here is where the art is reinforcing that. It's showing the, this worldliness. And it makes possible to a large extent the enlightenment that comes later. The scientific revolution comes later. But even the seeds of that, Copernicus, Galileo, uh, in the late Renaissance, you're seeing the seeds of that being sown, of the scientific revolution. But this is an era in which human beings rediscover the world and rediscover themselves. Emotion comes back into painting. Emotion comes back, comes into sculpture. You're seeing individuals being sculpted. It's David. It's not a David. It's not a Jesus. It's a particular Jesus. Sorry, it's not a generalized Jesus. It's not an abstraction of Jesus. It's not an abstraction of David. It's not an abstraction of Madonna and child. It's a real Madonna. It's a particular Madonna. It's a Madonna with a particular character and particular emotion and a particular set of features. And when a child is dead, she is crushed. So, for the first time since Rome, Individuality comes back into art. So with the discovery of Aristotle, not only is philosophy moving forward, not only are the beginnings of science moving forward, but maybe moving forward faster than anything else and reinforcing everything else and making possible everything else are the arts. Heroism, nudity, individualism, individuality, not individualism as an idea, but individuality, the recognition that we are individuals. And this is, of course, the foundation of Western civilization. This is what Western civilization is. I've said this many times. Western civilization is fundamentally two ideas. It's the idea of reason, ability to know reality, understand it. And it's the idea that it's individuals that matter, that individuals exist. And Florence and Leonardo and Michelangelo and Donatello and Botticelli and Brunelleschi and all these guys, I mean, there were a lot of them. They brought it into reality. They made it. And by the way, one of the reasons we know all this <laughs> One of the reasons we learned this is that one of these sculptures and painters during this period, a guy who lived towards the end of Michelangelo's life, was a guy named Vas Vasari. And Vasari wrote for the first time in human history, or the first time in modern history, detailed biographies of the artists of the time. 
and he was particularly enamored with Michelangelo. He believed Michelangelo to be the greatest artist in all of human history. And he wrote us a detailed biography of Michelangelo. But not only Michelangelo, this is a book that came out in three volumes, The Lives of the Artists. But think of a culture that values that, that believes in that. This is a culture that surrounded itself with beauty, where the artists were some of the most important people in their world. Now, what made it possible, what made it possible is the ideas of Aquinas, the ideas of Aristotle, the wealth of Florence generated through banking, and the relative intellectual freedom that existed in this part of Italy at the time. When you combine good ideas with freedom, with wealth, the outcome should be more wealth, but a flourishing in spiritual values. And that's what we're lacking today. We have relatively freedom. We have wealth. And yet, the channeling is not done towards great art. If, if, a, if a kid today in school shows great talent in drawing, they are not encouraged to go study art. They're not encouraged to be great artists because art today is against drawing. Art today is against the recreation of reality. Art today is worse than it was in the dark ages. It's against, particularly in, in the plastic arts, painting and sculpture. It is against reality. And therefore, there is no art today that is reflecting the intellectual ideas and the freedom and the wealth that we still have, some of us. Instead, they're reflecting, I guess they are reflecting the intellectual ideas of nothingness. They're reflecting the intellectual ideas of nihilism. They're reflecting the intellectual ideas of man as nothing. In a sense, we've gone back to being Christians, even if we don't call it that. It is a complete disintegration of art, complete disintegration of art. In many respects, worse than the Dark Ages. That's what we have today. And that's partially why we don't see the geniuses in art. They're born every day. They're not cultivated. They're not taught. They're not encouraged. And if they are, they land up splashing paint on canvas. They're taught it's all from emotion. Nothing, nothing. Um, reason has no role. All right, uh, you know, I love this period in art uh, history. I love this period in history generally. I, I, think, I think there's a lot, and, and this is just Italy, but there's a lot going on at the same time in Flanders and in uh, parts of Germany that is really, really fascinating and really, really interesting and really, really worth digging into. But again, the, the beauty of, of seeing, seeing the seeds of the ideas that would later become the Enlightenment and would later become, after that, would become Ayn Rand. These ideas of, of, of reason and individualism being seeded in the artwork of the Renaissance in Italy and later on going north and, and manifest themselves in, in, in northern Europe and then ultimately culminating in, um, in the Enlightenment. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm glad I think I ignored the chat today because it was really, really bad and had nothing to do with this. Uh, oh, I, I did want to say this about Florence, too. And I said this at the beginning, but I think it's important to note. Florence was at the core of the trade between the Muslim world and Europe. And the Muslim world played a huge role in, in the Renaissance by, by bringing better ideas into Europe, um, but also by bringing material wealth into Europe. Uh, and, and products that Europeans just couldn't make and couldn't produce, and, and, and really exposing Europeans to the world in a way that they couldn't because they were just too poor. So Florence centrality in the middle of Italy there, becoming this trade hub, be, and, and then becoming this banking center, you know, what made Florence what it is. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. Let's take a few Super Chat questions. I think they're all related to art, so that's good. Um, so, um, all 
Okay, thoughts on the work of Stanley Kubrick. I see brilliant technique, incredible vision, and masterful choice of collaborators, but gloomy sense of life. So Stanley Kubrick, one of the most famous directors of the last 50 years, uh, uh, two th 2001 Space Odyssey, um, uh, oh, Jesus, uh, let, let me just Google Stanley Kubrick because I give you a, uh, uh, a full, a, a full uh, resume, Kubrick movies, all right. Um, uh, Eyes Wide Shut, that's later, Full Metal Jacket, The Shining, Barry Lyndon, Clockwood Orange, 2001 Space Odyssey, Mr. Strangelove, Lolita, Spartacus, Paths of Glory, The Killing, I think The Killing was his first movie, although it says here there was something, there was some earlier movies, but I don't know them. Okay, the, the ones that are important are there. So I, I think Kubrick, again, let me say here the caveats, right? Um, the caveats are this. I believe, uh, I believe that uh, film is the most complex of all art forms, that to be able to analyze film, one must be able to analyze the visual the acting, the music, the, the whole integration of everything, and a director is responsible for that integration. So to evaluate a director is very, very difficult and, and requires real thinking and real knowledge. And my knowledge is to some extent, uh, to some extent limited. Now, by my estimate, with my limited knowledge, Kubrick is definitely a great director in the sense that he has an incredible ability to integrate every aspect of his movies into a theme that he is projecting. And he clearly has themes to his movies. The movies are just not there for nothing. Now, some of his movies, like Barry Lyndon, are kind of boring, and they last too long. But most of his movies are incredibly effective, and he made movies in pretty much every genre, from uh, science fiction, that would be 2001 Space Odyssey, horror, that would be The Shining, uh, 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 war, Full Metal Jacket, um, and uh, let's see, uh, another war one would be Path of Glory, uh, and, uh, you know, so, so it was uh, Path of Glory with Kirk Douglas, by the way. Now, one of my favorite movies is actually a, uh, a Kubrick movie, and that is Spartacus. I, I really love that 1960s Spartacus. I think it's a, it's a fantastic movie. It's one of my favorites. It's with Kirk Douglas. Um, and um, and it's got, a, I think, at the end, a good theme, although a tragic theme, of course. And the, um, let's see, let me think about the other movies. Spartacus is a great movie. Lolita is sick and depressing, but it's Lolita. It's a story. Why would you ever want to make a movie of that? Dr. Strangelove, I really enjoy. I think it's funny. I mean, I, philosophically, it's probably quite corrupt, but, um, but it's, it's very, very well made, beautifully acted, um, you know, dramatic, you know, amazingly acted, and a comedy. So there's another genre that Kubrick... So Kubrick did every single genre. 2001 Space Odyssey is... I, I, I don't understand it, never understood it, but it's an amazing movie with really memorable scenes. I can close my eyes and think of three or four different scenes from 2001 Space Odyssey. That doesn't happen in a lot of movies. So you get to see his visuals and how powerful his visuals are. Same, by the way, as Spartacus, very visually. Clockwood Orange is, again, an incredibly well-integrated movie. Evil theme and horrible and disgusting. Much of it is horrible and disgusting, but very cleverly done. And, and very, very well integrated. Uh, you know, unfortunately for a while there, he ruined listening to Beethoven's Fifth for me uh, because of how he uses that in the movie, but it's very effective in how he uses it. Um, I think his later movies are, uh, you know, uh, less interesting, if you will. Um, Eyes Wide Shut was boring. Barry Lyndon was boring. Full Metal Jacket was a good war movie. So very well integrated. So my... My estimation is he's a very good director with a very, very gloomy sense of life, with a very, uh, some of his stories are just horrible, Clockwood Orange in particular, it's just horrible, Full Metal Jacket is excru excruciatingly violent, horrifically violent, so, all right, that's Kubrick. Another question on Kubrick. As to Kubrick, what are your thoughts specific to Eyes Wide Shut and Current America? I mean, Eyes Wide Shut, I don't remember well enough, I was bored by it. Um, it, it basically was this, 
again, materialistic view of sex and nihilistic view of just a, just a life is boring, life is disgusting, you have to do all these weird sexual things in order to make it interesting. I don't remember it well enough to really comment, but I, I really think it's, it's, a, it's an example of the corruption of modern America, and Eyes Wide Shut, I think, is part of that. Um, I think it's corrupt that it was made into a movie, and it's, it's, but primarily it's boring, qua art. doesn't work. Um, what else? There are other questions. Okay. What are the best masculine, feminine, and romantic painters? <laughs> oh, I don't know, and that's a loaded question. I don't know what a masculine, feminine, and uh, painting painter is. What is a a painter have masculine things? I mean, I, I don't even know what the question really is. Um, I mean, you could talk about romantic, but romantic in what sense? Romantic in terms of the period? Romantic in terms of how Ayn Rand dis uh, defined romantic in art? Or romantic in terms of um, the way the culture sees romantic? Oh, a love affair between a man and a woman. Um, so, and how does romanticism apply to painting in the Ayn Rand sense? A hard one. I mean, I, there's a lot of... My favorite painters are primarily 19th century painters, Beyond the Renaissance, I, I love Caravaggio in the Renaissance, but I wouldn't call him romantic, and I certainly wouldn't call him masculine or feminine, although maybe, I don't know. Um, but but I, really like, I really like the 19th century painters of the British and uh, French Academy. Uh, you know, uh, Jerome in France, uh, um, uh, you know, Alma Tadema, and, uh, and uh, there's a bunch of them. So the 19th century, the, the pre-Raphaelites in England, I also like a lot. Uh, there's certain painters, like, uh, there's certain painters in Central Europe that are good. Of course, Northern Europe, you had, you had Vermeer, and you have a lot of the beautiful, beautiful Dutch painting, which I like a lot. But, I, you know, masculine, feminine, I don't know how you would even start with that. Um, what would be masculine and feminine about a painting? I'd have to really think about that. Let me think about it and hopefully get back to you in the future, some, some painter in the future. Painter who expressed femininity, masculinity, and romance. Well, I mean, Fragonard in the late 18th century does romance pretty well. Masculinity in painting. Masculinity in painting. Um, I mean, in the, certainly in the... In the, I mean, immediately masculinity comes to mind is sculpture, because sculpture to me is very masculine. Um, uh, you know, David, uh, uh, some of the, the the sculptures of Theseus. Uh, there's a sculpture in the Louvre called Spartacus, which I love in terms of the sh sheer masculine strength, rebellion. Um, you know, but but painting. Oh my God, what would be a you know, I'd have to think about it. Let me let me give you let me get back to you, Action Jackson. I, I I really, I just can't think of anything. Femininity, I mean, there's the Capoletti that I uh, that I, I really really love, that Ayn Rand owned. That in my view is the best painting that projects femininity uh, ever done. But and, and objectivists either hate it or love it. Uh, and I know a lot of objectivists who hate that that painting. I love it. It's in. I've got a copy of it in my house. Uh, one of my favorites. All right. Uh, I've got this. Uh, already just cuddling with a cat is not just physical pleasure, but about enjoying the form of a conscious living being. I agree with that. So how on earth can you say that sex is only physical pleasure even exists? Well, it's hard, right? Because I don't think it, for the most part, exists. But masturbation... It, you know, is purely physical pleasure or can be purely physical pleasure. I don't know. Getting a hand job from somebody um, could be purely physical pleasure, particularly if somebody you don't know. Um, a one-night stand certainly has a spiritual dimension because, as you said, it's a conscious living being. So, yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. I accept that, that, that at the end, sex cannot be purely physical because... At whatever level, there is somebody at the other side who is um, a conscious being. And even if that conscious being is not 
somebody you have a relationship with, an intimate, a, a detailed relationship with, because they're conscious, there's a spiritual element to what, they, to what you're engaging with them. Uh, and therefore, every sexual act, assuming there's another human being there, has a spiritual dimension because that's what their presence brings to the act. So it would have to be with a sex toy or some kind of machine like in uh, that Woody Allen movie. Uh, what was that Woody, Woody Allen science fiction movie where he goes into the sex machine and he has sex with the machine and then he comes out all disheveled and stuff. Um, that's a funny movie. Um, it's Woody Allen's first or second movie after um, the one about the Banana Republic. Um, Sleeper. It's Sleeper. Thank you. Sleeper. So uh, Sleeper, is, it, it's funny. But um, So once a human being is present, then it has to have a spiritual dimension. And then the question is, what kind of spiritual dimension? It could be a demeaning spiritual dimension. If it's somebody, you're having sex with somebody you don't know or you don't like. And then, so it, I mean, we'll talk about sex sometime. All right. Um, I really enjoyed this one. I like your shows on economics and politics. But, but more shows about art and history, too, please. All right. You've got a deal. We've got a deal. We'll do more on history and, um, and economics. Liberal Deutsch says even masturbation is, is partially, it's you imagining having sex with somebody for the most part. So it's, there is a spiritual dimension. Um, a spiritual dimension that is involved even in masturbation. I, I agree with you at the end of the day. I think that's right. I think there is a, you can have that spiritual dimension be small or large. If you go to see a prostitute, that spiritual dimension is, is, is minimalized and is negative often. It has a negative implication. If you're having sex with somebody you truly love, the love of your life, then that spiritual dimension is all encompassing. So the sex, the, the overlaid on, on the, integrated with that physical dimension is different spiritual dimensions depending on who you're having sex with and in what context. And uh, that can determine whether sex is amazing and fantastic or whether it's horrible, right? Amy, Amy says, Sinding's Slave, which is at the, um, at the Glyptotech in uh, Copenhagen, is also very masculine. I think sculpture... Not, and, and I can think of sculptures at the Glyptotech that are feminine. So I think sculpture, here's a, here's a claim. Uh, here's a claim that I'm going to make that I, I, I have to think about to see if I can actually prove this. But I think that sculpture is more feminine and masculine than painting. So sculpture is much more essentialized and about the human. It's about a man or a woman, depending on what you're sculpting, sculpting right? So the generalization you make from sculpture is about much more about the nature of man or woman, right? Whereas painting is much more about a story. There's much more going on. It's much more the use of color to tell a story, and you can tell a more abstract story, not just about the nature of man. You can tell, you can tell a much more detailed story in it. So sculpture is more essentialized, maybe why I like sculpture more, but it's more essentialized and it, because it deals primarily with nudity, it tells a story or it tells, it conveys directly masculinity and femininity in a way that painting, for the most part, doesn't. So I think you're going to find more sculpture that you can categorize as feminine and masculine than you will painting. Because that is in... Um, uh, somebody mentioned Leighton. Leighton was one of the names I was trying to think of. It's also the British, uh, uh, British uh, uh, Academy. So, yeah. So, that, so, so I think that you know, sculpture is more essentialized, more essentialized about being human, being a, a human being, and therefore much more likely to deal with themes that are related to your nature qua human being. And because it deals with nudity, and because it deals with men and women usually is distinct, it deals with, with that. If you want romance, Sindling's, Sindling's Kiss, um, which Amy uh, helped me discover, and it was, it's at the, um, at the beer company. What's the beer company in uh, Copenhagen? Uh, uh, I forget, but Amy will tell us. 
uh, at the headquarters of the beer company, there is the kiss, which is beautifully romantic, but it's a man and a woman, so it's about it's romantic love. It's, it's reflecting that romantic love. So I think, I think um, I think those kind of themes you're going to find more Heineken. That's right. It's in the no, not Heineken. No, it's not Heineken. Carlsbad, 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 Carlsbad. In the Carlsbad uh, headquarters, the beer company, Carlsbad headquarters in Copenhagen, they have uh, some of the sculptures that didn't make it into the Glyptotech, and there's some really magnificent sculptures there. And one of them is the Kiss, and uh, highly recommended to go visit there and see. Um, yeah, so I think the whole issue of masculinity and femininity is, is much more relevant for sculpture than it is for painting. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. A little bit different. And um, we will uh, we'll be back probably tomorrow and talking about Amy. I think we're on with Amy on Tuesday. So hopefully that'll happen. And uh, we're on again tomorrow. Probably go back to politics tomorrow. Yeah. Um, if you have questions that are unrelated to politics that you'd like me to cover, feel free to send me uh, an email, yuran at yuranbrookshow.com. Don't forget to support the show by going to yuranbrookshow.com slash support. Uh, your financial support both motivates me and makes it possible for me to devote the kind of time that I do to make these shows uh, go. And finally, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Share the show. Let your friends know. Let's grow the listenership to the Iran Brook Show. Particularly if you have friends who might be interested in art, let them know what we did here. And uh, art and history, art and history. Talk to you soon. Bye, everybody.